I'd like to take you back about six or seven years ago when I was in a family practice, a large group practice, and an encounter that I had with a patient that really changed my course for these past six to seven years. It's actually an encounter that wasn't so pleasant, and it involved a middle-aged woman named Shirley who came to our office, and she was coming in for her follow-up of diabetes. And as she came in, I had briefly prepped her chart and looked at her labs. I was not looking forward to this visit. One of her biggest fears was that someday she would have to take insulin. Her A1C was getting worse. So as I entered into the exam room, she was sitting down, and I started talking with her about how things were going and how she was feeling. And she said she was still feeling tired and she was struggling a little bit to really um, get to the place that she wanted in health. She had been following the dietary recommendations that we had counseled her on, so she was doing pretty much everything I had asked, and yet when I looked at those labs, I knew that really the next step I had to offer her in trying to get her numbers to look better was to give her insulin. As I overcame the pit in my stomach, this, that sinking feeling of doing something that you know that the patient's not going to be excited about and you're not really excited about, I broached the idea with her about starting on insulin. She was disappointed, and she thought that it, she was the failure. And I realized that it really wasn't her. It was just the situation. See, I didn't have much tools to be able to help her, and as I realized that I was already constrained on time, and that whole conversation that I just told you about took 15 minutes, and my MA was already knocking at the door telling me my next patient was ready. This really felt uncomfortable to me. In fact, I really didn't like it. This is not why I went to medical school. This was not why I got into medicine. I went to medical school to change lives, to help people get better, to get healthier. And yet here I was offering a medication that I knew was really going to make the patient uncomfortable, was going to cause her to probably have more depression, probably gain more weight, feel more sluggish, just so we could look at a paper and say, wow, your numbers look so much better. Well, fast forward now to just a few months ago, where I'm now practicing not in a conventional medicine, corporate-like family practice, but in my own integrated medical center where I have multiple resources to help me in caring for my patients. And in comes Robert. And Robert was a gentleman who had been referred to me, and he's changed lives for the better for many people. But he came to me looking for hope. For you see, Robert was diagnosed with ALS not too long ago. And as he went to a medical center with specialists who really understood ALS, they told him that this was a terminal diagnosis, and actually they didn't have really anything to offer Robert, which was really discouraging for him. And that's not the type of person he was, so he started to seek some kind of hope. And he had gone to this friend of mine who is an expert in nutrition, and he had started working on his diet. And they had started looking at labs, looking at causes as to potentially what had triggered this genetic abnormality in him to express itself in ALS. And so they came to me looking for additional help and support. And I thought back, wow, if I had been where I was six or seven years ago, I would have been like the specialist that they had seen and had nothing more to offer. But instead, I had many things to offer. We could offer him IV nutritional therapy. We could offer him uh, counseling for he and his family. We could look at the labs and continue to try and find ideas and things that potentially could be influencing how he was going because both he and I were determined to see what we could do to reverse this problem. One of the things that I like to keep in mind is that I, when I approach patient care, I always like to think about what can have the greatest impact with the little, least amount of harm. He left my office that day encouraged, hopeful, not unrealistic. He understands that 
the likelihood of his survival from ALS is not great, but he wants to go along that journey with somebody who cares about him and is willing to do everything they can to try and improve his quality of life. So hopefully Robert will have a long life ahead of him, and that journey will take him places that both he and I will learn and cherish. But if not, then if that journey is short, then we will have experienced something that was great together. So how did I get to this place where I had my own center and I was had all these resources with me? Well, it started with a dream. But as I started to realize that this was my dream, I realized that there was a lot of fears that I had to overcome to get to that dream. Fears of, well, what will my colleagues think if I start this own the center on my own or, or practice this type of medicine? Will patients actually show up if I go out on my own? Will this be financially viable? Will this all collapse on me? Will the Will the, the new president change the healthcare system such that now I, I can't practice the way I want to practice? Will I be able to really meet the needs of the patients in the way that I want to? All of these things were voices in my head that were telling me, oh, you're not going to succeed. You can't do this. But I realized that the first step in realizing my dream was overcoming that fear. I had to step out into an area that was uncomfortable for me in order to achieve greatness. And that's what I wanted to do. And one day a patient showed up about a little over four years ago in my office and said to me, you know what, I've been thinking a lot. When are you going to open your own practice? And so a week later she calls me because she couldn't stop thinking about this idea of me opening my practice practicing medicine the way that I had always been passionate about. And so that started me on this journey. But I realized, how did I get there? How did I go from a dream to reality, right? This was my dream, but it was still a big chasm between where I was and where I wanted to be. And I had these fears that I needed to overcome. And what I realized that in order for a dream to become a reality, I needed a vision. I needed a vision of how to get there. So as I established that vision, then I was able to bring people together and we were able to put that into action. We were able to start moving forward and we realized that we needed a mission statement that would ground us, that would keep us moving in the direction that we wanted to be and wouldn't get us too far off track. So we established a mission statement and with that vision and that dream, it soon became a reality which was amazing for me. And one of the things that I realized was it was all coming from inside. There's a, there's a quote that I love by Thurman, Howard Thurman, who was a civil rights activist just before Martin Luther King. He was a preacher in the South, and his whole purpose in life was to uplift, to strengthen, to encourage, to inspire others to greatness. And I love what he says about this genius, this genuine inside of you. He said, there is something in every one of you that waits and listens for the sound of the genuine in yourself. It is the only true guide that you will ever have. And if you cannot hear it, you will all of your life spend your days on the ends of strings that somebody else pulls. Well, that's powerful for me because that's how I felt six or seven years ago. I felt like a puppet and I was on these strings and managed care was pulling me this way and my bosses were pulling me this way and the financial struggle of the insurance companies was pulling me this way and the whole medical legal issue was pulling me this way and I, I was in this box that was not allowing the genuine inside of me to come out and express itself. And that wasn't satisfying. That depressive feeling that I had in sharing my thoughts with Shirley was not who I was and not what I wanted to be. And so when I discovered that there was a way to make that happen, that I, I sought after that. 
Well, again, what helped, what inspired me, what helped me to get to the point where this dream became this vision and reality? Well, there are many things that, that helped me along the way. But one of the things that helped me was walking a labyrinth. I'm not sure any of you have walked a labyrinth, but those of you who have know it's a really interesting exercise. Now, I'm not one for sitting down and doing a lot of meditation. I'm very active, I'm energetic, and it's hard for me to calm my mind and sit down, which is something that I need to work on a little bit more. But active medication, walking, running, things like that are really refreshing for me. And my wife and I were at a health spa, and she had been there before and walked this labyrinth, and she was really excited to share it with me. Come on, you can come in and, and walk this labyrinth, and it's, it's really amazing how it just connects you to who you are and, and, and moving you forward. And so I said, okay, I'm, I'm game for that. And so we got up to the labyrinth, and I looked at it. It looked a little bit like a maze. And she said, okay, before you step in, you should have a question or some kind of intention that you want to realize or think about or ponder as you walk back and forth along this labyrinth. Because the labyrinth just takes you back and forth into four quadrants until you arrive at the center. So this was right shortly after I'd had this conversation with this patient of mine who wanted to help me. And so I started walking the labyrinth with the intention of what does my clinic need to look like? What is it going to be like? And it came to me. As I walked back and forth, I realized that I wanted to have resources available to me. I wanted to have somebody who could help me in teaching my patients about lifestyle, about nutrition. I wanted to have a naturopath, an acupuncture, a chiropractor, a, a psychologist, so that we could have this team together so that it didn't fall all on my my shoulders because I knew that I had limitations in how much I could learn and how much I would know, but that there were other modalities that I would be an expert in that could be very beneficial and helpful for my patients. So I wanted a place that would have all of that included. And so that realization really lay, uh, came to, to life for me while I was walking the labyrinth. And other of you may decide to do a vision quest or you go out and you just spend that quiet time. But it's important that you do because that's where you will get grounded and that genuine inside of you will start to call to you. And it's an amazing thing. Another thing that really helped me was learning more about integrative medicine and functional medicine. As I went to these conferences, I met other like-minded individuals who I connected with. And particularly with functional medicine, where I started to learn the whys. Why does somebody have a headache? So all of these things made a profound impact on me and shaped this path that I was on for the last six to seven years. So as we set up our clinic and we looked at our mission statement, we realized that how we, we made decisions in setting things up, there was a pattern to this. We realized that the patient was at the center. And that as we looked at that modality or that treatment option or that, that nutraceutical, we were then able to say, okay, well, does this fit with the physicians as well? So we had the patient at the center and then the lifestyle and the learning and the commitment of the physician next. And then we have, is this financially viable? And we hope that it would be. And a lot of times it has been, but there's been times where we've actually said, you know what, this is important to me as a provider. This is going to be really good for the patient. And if we don't make any money at it, that's okay. Because that was at the very top of our pyramid and the very last priority in deciding whether or not we were going to bring something in. Well, that's opposite of, again, where I had come from, where the primary focus was making money, the bottom line. And I had been told many times when I was trying to bring in nutrition classes or I was wanting to bring in a new therapy that, oh, well, that's not financially viable or we can't make money with that or um, is that legal, legal or not or are we going to get in trouble for that? The, the focus wasn't on what's best for the patient at all or what even the physician was going to bring them satisfaction. So this has been a tool that has been really helpful in us establishing a place that has been phenomenal 
to practice that. And it was interesting because I came across a journal article in the American Journal of in Internal Medicine in the spring of 2015, about a year after we had opened. And as I was looking at this, it was entitled Healthcare 2020, Reengineering Healthcare Delivery to Combat Chronic Disease. Well, this caught my attention. Dr. Milani and, La and Le Levy were talking about some of the obstacles that was keeping us from treating these chronic illnesses. And you see, in America, we have over 15 million hypertensives. We have over 12 million diabetics. And we have over 8 million cardiovascular disease patients, most of which are preventable. And yet we're struggling to take care. And this burden was only going to get greater as they projected by 2020. And so they wrote this review, this article, in hopes of changing the mindset, of getting a different idea about how we could approach chronic illness. Well, this resonated with me. And so I looked at the article, and it was interesting because they came up with four things. And one was demands on physician time. That was certainly my case before, where seven to 15 minutes, maybe if I was lucky, I got 30 minutes with a patient. That's not enough. Back in the 60s, there were about 100,000 articles that would come out every year. By 2012, it was close to 2 million. There is no way that as a provider, we can keep up with the latest and greatest. Third thing that they talked about was therapeutic inertia, where there's so many demands on the patient and on our time and that the, there's non-compliance and then there's loss to follow up hard to keep track because we're seeing so many patients every day that there's not really good follow-up. We don't have a great team to keep everything in, in check. And so these, these things were seen as obstacles. And the fourth was that, was uh, continued on this idea that there wasn't a great team. And so what they were suggesting is that moving away from where the primary care doctor, the patient comes in, sees the primary, and then he sends them out to specialists, and even may have a managed care team to kind of oversee and call the patient to see if they're compliant with their medications and meeting the standards of care that have been set by CMS, but that they recommended that there will be a team of even non-physician helpers, such as a lifestyle educator a nutritionist, a psychologist, an acupuncturist, a, a chiropractor, physical therapy. And I looked at our clinic and realized, wow, we're pretty close to doing that. We're really close to doing that. We're reversing chronic illness in our clinic. And that's exciting. That's refreshing. I get up every morning excited to go to work because of that. And I tell you, there was a time, even in medical school, I was ready to drop out because it wasn't what I was going into medicine for. And I'm sure some of you can relate to the same thing. Bravewell Collaborative, a few years ago, went and investigated integrative medicine in the university setting and in the private se sector. And they collected all of this data, and in their summary, they said something that really resonated with me. They said, integrative medicine is an approach to care that puts the patient at the center and addresses the full range of physical, emotional, mental, social, spiritual, and environmental influences that affects a person's health. Employing a personalized strategy that considers that patient's unique conditions, needs, and circumstances it uses the most appropriate interventions from an array of scientific disciplines to heal illness and disease and help people regain and maintain optimum health. Well, that's exactly what they were talking about, Dr. Milani and Lavi were talking about in this article, an integrated approach to help keep the patient at the center and take care of all of their needs to help them move in a direction of optimal health. And so integrative medicine has been amazing for me because of that. And I am so fortunate to have a great team around me that has helped support me. I could not have done it on my own. And this team came to me not because 
I was looking in the yellow pages or because I was searching on LinkedIn, they came because they resonated with my dream. So as you try and build a team around you, it's share your ideas, share your vision, share your dream, and you will find like-minded people start to show up for you. And together you can create something really, really special. So I'd encourage you to, again, develop your own decision-making tree so that you can decide whether something is right for your clinic and your patients. So in summary, the five tips that I have for overcoming your fear and realizing your dream are first, don't let fear stop you. Step outside your comfort zone. Realize something bigger than who you are. Listen to the genuine inside of you. Follow your inspiration. There's a reason you got into medicine. Go back to those roots and follow that. Or do what's in the best interest of the patient so that your focus is on helping them because that's rewarding. That'll bring satisfaction and allow you to wake up in the morning and be excited about what you do. And then find your team. You can't do this alone. It's really hard. So find the right team and bring them together and blend that into your practice. And then make sure, lastly, that you practice medicine that brings you joy. Because if you don't love what you do, you need to change what you do. Success isn't just about what you accomplish in your life. It's about what you inspire others to do.